Hey everyone, in this video, I'm gonna give you an introduction to hash tables and dictionaries. First of all, let me explain what a dictionary is, and then I'm gonna explain how it can be implemented using a hash table. So here's an example of a dictionary. As you might guess, this is essentially a table uh, that shows different people's age. And uh, you can ask this table or this dictionary, how old is Paul, for example? Then you get the number 29 right away. Or you can ask it, uh, how old is Chloe? And you get 88. Uh, and that operation uh, can be called search because you're looking for a specific key, for example, Paul, uh, to find the corresponding value, uh, in that case, 29. And these uh, pairs are often called key value pairs, by the way. So a dictionary is basically a collection of these key value pairs or a data structure that can store these key value pairs so that you can retrieve the value of any of those keys quickly. And in a dictionary, you can define a few more operations. Uh, one is insert, and that would be adding a new entry to this table by saying Bob is eight, for example. Another one is uh, delete, and that would be deleting an existing entry. For example, you might say, well, I don't want this uh, data about Chloe anymore. Uh, when you implement a dictionary, uh, you should be able to implement it ideally uh, so that all of these operations take only O of one in time on average. And a hash table is a good way to do that. To build a hash table, the first thing you'll need is an array. So here I have an array of eight elements, just as, as an example. And let's say that we want to use that array or that hash table to represent the dictionary that we saw earlier, this one. To do that, uh, we're going to put each key value pair in one of these slots. Uh, but to do that, we need a way to decide uh, which key value pair is going to go into which slot of this array. One way to do that uh, would be to look at the first letter, the first character of each key, and uh, compare it to the letter A, and compute how many characters away it is uh, from the letter A. So for example, for this key, Paul, uh, you can look at uh, the first letter P, convert it to the lowercase p, and compare it to the lowercase a, and in ASCII code, you'll be able to see that P is 15 characters away from A. But 15 wouldn't be an index of this array because that would be out of range. So you would need to use, uh, for example, the mod operator, uh, mod 8, mod of the length of the array, uh, to get the desired range. Uh, that would be 0 to 7 inclusive. And with that method, you would get uh, 7. So at that point, you can put this key value pair, Paul29, over here at index 7. And just like that, we can decide uh, which index of the array we want to use for each key value pair. So Jane would be over here at index 1, Chloe would be over here, and Alex would be over here. And actually, what I showed you here is already a hash table. Uh, so basically, to construct a hash table, you need an array and a dictionary you want to represent and a way to decide which index of the array you want to use for each key value pair. Another way to describe the same thing would be to say we need a function that turns each of these keys, uh, whether they're strings or anything else, into an index of this array uh, that we constructed. And we could call that function for example, h1, uh, with the method that I just showed you, h1 of Paul would be 7. And this function is usually called a hash function, and that's why this whole thing is called a hash table. But this particular hash function that I just showed you uh, might not be ideal for a few reasons. One of them is this. Uh, if you consider English names, there might be a lot of names that start with j, and if you put, uh, for example, Josh in this dictionary or this hash table, it would try to go into the same bucket as Jane. And the same thing with uh, Jennifer. And that would be called a collision uh, when multiple keys would uh, try to go into the same spot uh, of this array. And there is a way to deal with collisions, and we're going to talk about those. 
But for now, uh, you should know that we want to avoid uh, collisions as much as possible to keep your uh, hash table efficient. And so one way to deal with a problem like that would be to consider uh, most of the letters or many of the letters in the given key, if not all of the letters. And one such function is called uh, djb2. And I'm going to put a link to some information about that in the description, just in case you're curious about it. Anyway, when you're choosing a hash function for your hash table, there are a few things that you should consider. One is that it should be fast to compute. And the other one is that uh, it should try to avoid collisions as much as possible. And that's pretty much it when it comes to the criteria. Uh, in some textbooks, they might say uh, your hash function should be uniformly distributed or random looking or something like that. But uh, it's really not necessary for practical purposes. And it's not necessarily better than non-uniformly distributed uh, functions. So if you're choosing a hash uh, function for your hash table, you should really only consider uh, these two criteria. And when you're choosing a hash function for security purposes, you might have other concerns. But here, we're only talking about a hash function for a hash table. OK, uh, let's now talk about how to deal with collisions. We're going to talk about two families of methods for dealing with collisions in this video. And the first one is called chaining. With this method, instead of storing the key value pairs directly in the array, uh, we're going to store them in a linked list. And from each element of the array, we're going to have a pointer uh, to that linked list. And that linked list is going to contain all the key value pairs that were assigned uh, to that particular slot in the array. So for example, if you have another key value pair that was assigned to this same slot, then what we'll need to do is we'll need to put the new key value pair at the beginning or at the top of this linked list, just like that. And if you have uh, another key value pair that was assigned to an empty slot, then we'll need to create a new uh, linked list containing this single element, and then uh, have a pointer that points to the new linked list from that slot. And with chaining, uh, insertion only takes O of 1 in time or a constant amount of time. And what about search? Well, to explain that, I'll need to first define a few variables. Uh, n here is the number of elements that we have put in so far in this hash table. And m is the length of the array. So this alpha, which is n over m, is going to show how full this hash table is. So right now, because n is 4 and m is 8, uh, alpha is exactly a half. And with this, uh, you can show that uh, search only takes O of 1 plus alpha in time. What this means is that if you keep alpha below a certain number, uh, below, let's say, 1, uh, search would only take a constant amount of time. And this O of 1 plus alpha is the average uh, time. And here you might say, what if I don't want to use this extra data structure outside of this array? Then uh, the approach you might want to use is called open addressing. And there are a few different flavors for it. Uh, I'm going to explain the simplest one first, which is linear probing. With linear probing, or with open addressing in general, uh, we store all the key value pairs within the array itself, just like you can see here. Uh, let's say here that we have another key value pair uh, that collides with this one. Then with linear probing, all we need to do is uh, we'll need to check the element that's directly to the right uh, of the collision. And if it's empty, we can just put it there. And if another uh, element collides with this one again, uh, we'll need to check this element and then this element next until we find an empty element. And then we can put it in there. So just like that, uh, if uh, this new key value pair collides with this one, we'll need to keep checking the elements to the right until we find an empty one. So I would say linear probing is an OK approach 
but it could be inefficient when you have a lot of elements. And that's because these elements are likely to uh, start forming clusters when you have a lot of them. So for example, you have uh, a cluster of five elements here. And when you have a cluster of five elements or maybe a lot more elements, it would take you know, extra time to go through all of them and to find an empty spot. And one way to solve that issue is uh, called double hashing. So let me explain how double hashing works. Let's say that uh, this key value pair happens to collide with this one. Then what we're going to do is similar to linear probing in a way that we're going to jump ahead and check other elements to see if they're empty. But instead of uh, jumping ahead by one element, uh, we're going to pick a number here, uh, let's say 3, uh, to determine how many elements uh, we want to check ahead. So if we pick 3 here, we're going to check 1, 2, 3, this element, the third element, and we're going to check every third element ahead of that. So since this is empty, we're going to put it here. But if another uh, pair collides with this one, and if we happen to pick uh, 3 again, we're going to check the third element, and then we're going to jump ahead by 3 elements again. So that would be 1, 2. Uh, it would be this element, but since it doesn't exist, we're going to jump back here. And the nice thing about double hashing is that every time we have a collision, uh, depending on the key or depending on the starting point, we're going to produce uh, a slightly different uh, sequence every time, uh, the sequence of the elements that we're going to check. So let's say that this uh, new pair collides with this one. Uh, we might uh, pick uh, 1 uh, for the number of elements uh, that we're going to jump ahead. If we pick 1, we're going to just go to this element and find that this is empty. So it, we don't necessarily jump from here to here and have another equation. And that's why uh, we're less likely to have clusters in double hashing. And that's why it can be uh, more efficient than linear probing. To summarize this, um, we first pick uh, our initial index for the given key with a hash function. Uh, h1 with the mod operator uh, the length of the array, uh, in this particular case, 8. And then uh, the next index that we're going to check is going to be the original index plus c, uh, the number that we're going to pick for the particular key, uh, mod 8. And uh, the next one after that is going to be i plus 2c, mod 8, and so on. And here, I think the natural question would be, how do we pick this number c? Well, one condition that we need to satisfy is that uh, GCD of c and m, or the greatest common divisor or the greatest common factor of c and m, should be 1. And m uh, is the length of the array here. And that's because by uh, satisfying this condition, we can make sure that uh, this sequence of indices will eventually cover uh, the entire array. And one convenient way to make sure uh, that's true is to always set m, the length of the array, to be a prime number and c to be a positive integer. And that way, gcd of c and m will automatically be 1. OK, so how do we pick c? Uh, here's one way of uh, picking it, assuming that m is a prime number. Uh, we're going to use a second hash function, which we're going to call h2, and then we're going to put a uh, key into that function, and then uh, do some operations here. So let me explain what we're doing here. Here, we're applying the mod operation uh, with m minus 1 uh, to the result of the hash function. And that way, uh, the range of the results that we can get from uh, this whole uh, expression is going to be 0 to m minus 2 inclusive. And by adding 1 uh, to that result, we're going to get the range 1 to m minus 1 inclusive, and that's the range that we want. And here, the natural question after that is, how do we pick h2? Uh, for that, I ran an experiment, and I tried a few different approaches. 
So here's uh, the first approach I tried. Uh, we have h1, the original hash function. And to make h2, I simply appended a letter, which I picked. It could be anything, but I picked d here, to the key. So if the key is Jane, I just put Jane d to h1. And then I use that as h2. And it, it actually seemed to perform uh, pretty well. And by the way, uh, the h1 I used uh, for this one is the default hash function of Python, uh, which seems to be based on DJB2, which I mentioned earlier. And the second approach I tried is simply this. So I used exactly the same uh, hash function as the original one, as the second hash function. And somewhat surprisingly, it performed as well as uh, the first approach. But I would say if you want to try implementing double hashing uh, yourself, you should try a few different uh, hash functions because uh, the performance probably depends on your particular environment and the particular kind of input data that you get. Anyway, with double hashing, uh, you can show that with a few assumptions that uh, to complete either the search operation or the insertion operation, you need to check at most this number of elements on average. Uh, that's 1 over 1 minus alpha, where alpha is n over m. So again, n is the number of uh, elements that we've put in so far in the hash table, and m is the length of the array. So uh, just like I said before, alpha shows uh, how full uh, your hash table is. So let's say that alpha is 2 thirds. Then this expression, 1 over 1 minus alpha, becomes 3. So that means that uh, to complete search or insertion, you need to check at most uh, three elements on average. So basically, if you keep alpha below a certain number, uh, let's say 2 thirds again, uh, you'll be able to complete search or insertion in uh, constant time. Uh, so what I would suggest if you're implementing uh, double hashing uh, by yourself, well, at least one way uh, to do that would be to pick uh, m to be a prime number, let's say uh, 7 or 701. And then uh, as soon as alpha becomes uh, greater than 2 thirds, resize the array, pick a larger uh, prime number, than the original m, uh, and then uh, transfer all the elements uh, to the new array. And that way, uh, resizing the array uh, takes extra time, but at least for search and insertion, uh, it's only going to take a constant amount of time, as long as alpha uh, stays low enough. OK, so that's my introduction to hash tables and dictionaries. But there are a few things I wanted to mention before I go. Uh, one is that there is a coding interview problem that I covered a while ago on this channel. And for that problem, you can actually use one of these concepts to solve it. So I'll put a link to that video in the description below just in case you want to watch it. Uh, the other one is that I tried implementing a hash table in Python. So I'm going to put a link to that code in the description below as well. And from that code, you'll be able to see how I ran the experiment I mentioned earlier too. Anyway, thank you as always for watching my videos and I'll see you guys in the next one.